us for all that you have done. Lord, you are good all the time and all the time. You are good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise your name. Hallelujah. 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 Your mercies are renewed every morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I can't speak for you, but I thank God for one more opportunity to say yes. You don't know what I know about what God has done for me. You don't know like I know that I don't take standing here at this moment with you all for granted. You don't know, like I know, what it took to make sure that I had this opportunity and follow through on it. You don't know, like I know, that this is a big deal that I'm standing here in front of you this morning. You don't know. You just don't know, like I know. And so I thank God for this opportunity to be before you, to be with you, to be in his presence, to be in this place, to have this purpose, Lord God, and the oxygen in my lungs and the energy in my body to be here with you and to serve you on his behalf. Amen? Amen. I pray that you had a, a blessed and a beautiful uh, Fourth of July. I will tell you I had a wonderful time. Uh, I have a picture on the lock, uh, the, 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 what do you call it, the lock screen or the wallpaper of me and all five of my grandchildren. So you know I get to look at that multiple times a day, multiple times a day. All of my children, all of my uh, in-laws, children-in-laws, and all of my grandchildren. And thank God Brother Melvin was also with us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. It was a great family day. And so I am grateful that you don't take, I can't, I can't take that for granted. I do not take that for granted. I will not take that for granted. And so I thank God if he does nothing else for me. From this day forward, he did that. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, um, we are still praying for all of those who are on the prayer list. But we want to point out in particular, um, Wendy. That is uh, Sister Glenda's friend. Uh, that she visits in the nursing home frequently, but she is now, at least since the 4th of July, she's been in the hospital in critical condition, and our amazing sister Glenda has been by her side the entire time. She went home to take a shower once, but other than that, she has been present and accounted for. Amen for her friend, and I believe she's there with her at this very moment. So we want to pray for Sister Wendy, amen? that the perfect will of God would occur in her life. What we'd prefer to have happen is for her blood pressure to stabilize so that she can get the treatments that she needs. Amen? But the most important thing is that she's in the arms of Jesus. The most important thing is that she recognizes from whence cometh her help. The most important thing is that her soul be saved. Amen? Hallelujah. That, 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 she, that whenever she transitions, whether that's today or 10 years from now, that she goes to the place that she'll have happiness and no more tears. No more sickness. Amen. Amen. Only joy. Amen. Joy unspeakable forevermore Amen. in the presence of the Lord. Amen. I also want to quickly mention that there will be, as I mentioned, I think a week ago, a small service. This is the way he would want it for Brother Clint Martin. Amen. Amen. And uh, I said it was likely going to be on the 13th, but I didn't make that firm. But I believe we can say firmly that there will be a small service for Brother Clint Martin at the Riverside uh, Veterans Memorial Cemetery on July 27th. There will be a repast where there will be a whole bunch of folks from all over the place. <laughs> Amen. And we will give you more information for those who are interested. Uh, that will come later. Amen. As we get those things, the places and place and time uh, firmed up. Amen? Amen? Is God good? All the time. And all the time. God is good. In the good times, he's good. In the tough times, he's good. In your happy times, of course he's good, right? But in your sad times, he's also good. He's better than good to me and to you. Amen? We get to come together this morning in this place 
and say so. We get to say it and not just hear ourselves saying it, but we get to hear our brothers and sisters saying it. So, and we can imagine their testimonies behind it. We can imagine the ways out of no way that he made. We can imagine the things that he did that we didn't deserve. We can just imagine that. So whatever the blessing is for us individually, it gets multiplied when we come together on Sunday morning. Now, last week we learned from the early church, and in particular I would say the earliest portion of the church and its history. Well, this morning we get to continue learning from the early church. I hope you're not bored with the early church. Amen? But today we're going to fast forward a little bit in time, and we're going to learn from the Apostle Paul, so I hope you're prepared to learn. The title of this message might surprise you. It's titled Lessons from the Early Church, Part 2, Remembering the Poor. I didn't know that this was going to be a series. I didn't plan it. I, I, I never do. But it's time, we, it, it's, it's ordained for us to continue learning from the early church. And in this particular case, the message is titled, Remembering the Poor. This message is, dear friends, about money. And yet it's not really about money. It is about giving to other people financially of what belongs to you. And yet, if you listen carefully, it's not entirely about money. And if you hang in there long enough and, and give me the time, you'll probably learn something that you didn't already know. And if you already know it, my guess is if you hang in there with me long enough, You'll get to know something even better than you already know it. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for allowing me to be here this morning, representing you and delivering your word, your message, Lord God, from your heart. I ask, Lord God, that you would strengthen me and give me what it takes, Lord, to deliver your word to your people in the way that you want it. I thank you and I praise you for the opportunity, Lord God, Put aside any imperfections that I have, Lord God, and have you increase as I decrease. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Now, uh, when we, I will tell you that the title of this message, as I said before, uh, we're talking about lessons from the early church, remembering the poor. It seems like a very simple uh, title, and I hope that it is simple, but it comes from the key verse in our anchor text. And our anchor text, and you can go there now if you'd like to, will be found in the book of Galatians chapter 2. We spent a little bit of time there, I think last week or the week before. And we're going to be looking at verses 9 and 10. And so for my note takers and Bible studiers, I will also mention that there's plenty of supporting text, which we will go to or we will find in the book of Acts, in, in 1 Corinthians 2 Corinthians, and the book of Romans. And so we'll begin at our anchor text, and that will be in the book of Galatians, chapter 2. So if you could please go there, amen. Galatians, chapter 2. Now, as we approach Galatians as a, as a, in general as a book, what we find is, is Paul is writing to the Galatians about how quickly He's shocked at how quickly that they fell into legalism. He gave them the liberality, li liberality that was in the Lord uh, according to salvation, but they had fallen so quickly into legalism. And in the same letter, he's defending his apostolic calling and his apostolic authority. This is what we find him in terms of his agenda in writing this letter to the Galatian church, which he had established on his first missionary journey. Now, before I go any further, I want to—I forgot to invite and, and welcome those who are here online, and I want to acknowledge Brother Cheyenne. Amen. We're glad to see him here this morning. It's a blessing. And so as we look here at uh, Galatians uh, chapter 2, and if we go to verse 9, and we're talking about our anchor text here, 
And in particular, when we get to verse 10, that will be our key verse. But verse 9 reads this way. And when James, and this is again the Apostle Paul, uh, giving his case for his apostolic authority and calling. And when James, Cephas, which is Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, meaning they were pillars, they were the key leaders of the early church at Jerusalem, perceived or realized the grace that was given unto me, meaning by God, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, meaning the Gentiles, and they go to the circumcision, meaning the Jews. Now, now we because of the in the interest of time, because I don't want to keep you too long. I want to make I want to make really good on time today. Uh, uh, what they're talking about, they're referring to, and we studied this back when we learned about why was Tim Timothy circumcised. This is referring to the council session that, that, that is documented in, in Acts chapter 15. We won't go there, but you can find it there, and you have seen it there. But they were addressing this issue of legalism. Because when they got back, they were so excited when they finished the first missionary journey and they got back to Antioch, they were so excited about the work of the Lord that had been done among the Gentiles and with the Gentiles. And yet somebody said, well, wait a minute, they got to become Jews first. And so this issue needed to be adjudicated. And so now they're down in council to deal with this. And they argued and they argued and they debated and they debated. And Peter got up and said something mighty profound because his eyes had been opened. And so they wrestled with this issue of the expectation that the Gentiles had to become Jews first and obey all of the Mosaic law in order to become Christians. And we won't highlight all of the four requirements, but we all know that there were only four requirements, mostly having to do with what you put into your body, that they added to the simple basics of repentance and belief, baptism, and Holy Ghost filling. Amen? And so there were only four additional requirements of the Gentile believers, and we're not listing them here, and they're not listed here because by this time they were taken as a known. They were taken as a given. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And so with that in mind, I want to read the key verse, verse 10. It seems so simple. And yet it is the fulcrum, it is the anchor for what we're going to talk about today. It simply reads this way, only they, in other words, he could also say that yes, they required the four things, but other than that, only they would, they wanted, that we should remember the poor. The same which I also was forward, meaning I was eager, meaning I was zealous, meaning I planned to be very diligently to do. Amen. Amen? I plan to be diligent in remembering the poor. I was eager to do what I could to remember the poor. I was zealous to do. I couldn't wait to do what I could do for the poor. Amen? Now, as we read this with our 21st century Christian minds, the first thing that we think of is, is of course, we should remember the poor, right? It's a no-brainer. We should remember the poor wherever we go, wherever we find them, wherever we encounter them. But it's important for the full understanding and to get exactly what we're supposed to get here to understand that they, didn't, they weren't saying, go off and care about the poor everywhere that you go. Did you know that? When you read that, they say, remember the poor. Do you, like I used to, think that they were just saying, yeah, you should be so benevolent. You should be great. You should be awesome among the poor. You should be giving. You should be caring. All which Jesus preached. All which is right. All which is good. But in this particular case, and I'm going to try not to go on a tangent because there's other things I want to teach you as we say what I'm about to say. 
in this particular case, after they told them, you know what? You don't have to work. The, the Gentiles don't have to be Jews first. They don't have to observe all the law. Just tell them these four things and that will suffice because it'll make it easier for them to live peaceably along with their Gentile Christian convert brothers and sisters. Because eating was intimate. And if you couldn't be intimate, how could you have fellowship? So how can you have fellowship if you're at odds over something so basic, something so intimate? I am trying not to go on the tangent as I say that. But what I want you to be sure of to understand here is that what they meant here in terms of remembering the poor, they were talking about the poor people, the poor Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. Because as you may recall, that when Barnabas went off to go get Paul, just in the beginning of Paul's ministry, and he brought him back to Antioch, and they ministered and everything was going well, there was a prophet named Agabus that came up there and said, actually, you know, there's going to be a dearth, there's going to be a famine in the land. And, and he said all the world. What that really meant is all of the Roman world, the world that they really knew. Amen? And he's trying to let you know it's going to hit particularly hard among the people who live in Jerusalem. And we know that there's a disadvantage by being a Christian, so you're dependent really on just other Christians. So our Christian, mainly Jewish folk, believers in Jerusalem will be hit particularly hard. So Paul, I want you to go and I want you to minister to those Gentiles and I want you to make sure that you tell them these four things and go and build the church, but have all those Gentiles remember their poor Jewish brethren back home in Jerusalem. That's what this was talking about. We want to make sure we get our context proper, amen? Hallelujah. Because they would be suffering more intensely than everyone else during this time as Paul journeys. Now, right upon, and we won't go there, but, and you know this already, but just by, by way of review, upon that prophecy, they immediately did what? Did they pray for him? Maybe they did. But the main thing the Bible says that they did is they took up a collection. They did something about it. Amen. They took up a collection and, and when they took up that collection, they sent that collection to Jerusalem by way of Paul and Barnabas. Now, we mostly remember Paul and Barnabas going there to talk about all of the all of the, 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 the legalistic issues that I just talked about earlier. But way before that, before they ever went on the first missionary journey, they took this money down to Jerusalem for those Jewish Christians who they knew either were already suffering but certainly would suffer, amen, as this famine took hold. And you can look at all of that, and it's, it's, it's found uh, in, in the book of Acts 11 and 12. And so what I want to look at is I just want to look at one little verse, verse 12. If you'll go to the, to the book of Acts, chapter 12, verse 25, do that for me. Acts chapter 12, verse 25. Say amen when you have it. Amen. Say amen when you have it. Amen. Acts chapter 12, verse 25. There's a whole lot of stuff I could have covered. I only want to cover this. It reads very simply. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, that is back to Antioch, when they what? had fulfilled what? Their ministry. Their ministry, and they took with them John, Mark, John, who was surnamed Mark. Now, of course, we use that to spin off a whole nother discussion, right, about how, why Timothy was circumcised and the whole fight that Paul and Barnabas got into, and then Paul ended up going off with Silas instead and all that sort of stuff. But, but this particular verse, what it's saying, again, they haven't even gone on a missionary journey. They're buddies right now. They're developing their special bond. This is why. It's going to be good for them to go off to the first missionary journey. But before all of that, there was a prophecy. Before all of that, there was a known need. Before all of that, we knew that the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem were going to suffer. And we know that they took up an, an offering. Yes, they probably prayed, but they did something about it. And Paul and Bar Barnabas and Saul, he was called Saul at this time, they returned from Jerusalem when they finished, when they fulfilled their ministry. 
And then they took John, whose surname is Mark. Why did I want to cover this? Why this verse in particular? Because of that word ministry. Because as soon as we see ministry and we see these two ministers of the gospel who helped build the church, we assume that what they came to Jerusalem to do was to preach and to teach. That's what picture comes to our mind. They finished their ministry. But no, this word is diakonia. It means service or ministry. Mainly ministry, ministering means serving. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This comes from the word diakonos, which you know very well, which means servant or minister, which is where we get the word deacon. Why am I saying this in the beginning of this particular message? Because their service, which was bringing the offerings to deal with the suffering so that they'd have food in their bellies, was also ministry. It doesn't sound so religious, but it's important ministry, just as important as all other aspects of ministry. When they finished that, they were done. Amen? They didn't need more preaching at the time. They didn't need more teaching at the time. They didn't need exegesis at the time. They didn't need speaking in tongues at the time. What they needed was their bellies filled. What they needed was to know somebody cared about them. What they needed was to know they had food on the table, amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I want to make sure that we understand something. When there's a famine, this is important, and it's going to be important in the end times. When there is a famine, and this is why, when you talk about those first four horses, the white one, which is the Antichrist, and all the others, and when they start talking about famine, what they do is they talk about it in terms of how much a loaf of barley costs. Because a famine doesn't eliminate all food. What it does is it makes it scarce. So all of a sudden it becomes more expensive. So then the people who are most vulnerable are those who can't afford it. Do you hear me? So when we talk about famine, we're automatically talking about money. Even though famine is about food, well, you know, nobody's just dropping. Ain't no manna being dropped these days. So the poor are more vulnerable. Amen? The rich can buy anything they want, but the poor, when there is a famine, are more vulnerable. And we learn about the communal living, right? And we learned last week or two weeks ago, whenever, I think it was last week, that it's not perfect. Well, it also, during a famine, when it's extra hard in one area, also not enough. It's also not enough. So we have to think of even more globally in terms of our togetherness. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And this is even more apropos to us. It's, it's more relevant to us because we don't live communally. So today, this kind of giving, we can apply directly to our lives. We don't get to say, well, I'm not in the first century. I'm not at the very beginning of the church. We don't live communally. I'm not, giving, I'm not selling everything and putting it at the feet of the apostles. Great. So this Sunday is for you. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So now, what we're going to do is we're going to follow Paul. We're literally going to follow Paul through a portion of his third missionary journey, and we're going to learn from his teaching on giving. Is that all right? Paul took this part of his ministry very seriously. We might not notice it. There's times he's talking about giving, And we lose track of it. We aren't paying attention. So we think he's talking about some other more religious type of ministry, some other more quote unquote religious part of the Christian walk. But he took this part of his ministry extremely seriously, as we noted in our anchor text. So go with me, if you will, to the book of first Corinthians. And go to chapter 16. Paul wrote this book. He's in Ephesus now, okay? He's in Ephesus, and he is writing to the Corinthian church from Ephesus. And as we go to verse 16, chapter 16, I'm just going to read the first three verses, and if you'll read them along with me, that would be fantastic. He says, now concerning the collection for the saints. What saints? Louder. The Jewish saints in Jerusalem. 
okay? So content concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. So I told the Galatians to be prepared to give to the saints in Jerusalem. I want you also in Corinth to be prepared to give something for the saints in Jerusalem. He goes on to say in verse 2, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. The first day of the week is which day? The first day of the week is which day? <laughs> it's Sunday, isn't it? The first day of the week, I want you to lay by each man, to lay by him in store, as God hath what? Prospered him. So that means whatever you have, you see God is having prospered you, that there be no gatherings when I come. I want you to put it away now. I want you to set it aside now so that we won't have to be taking up an offering when I come. Woo! Mm -mm -mm. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality, liberality unto Jerusalem. Now, what I want you to notice here, in addition to the little bit that we learned about him telling them to put it aside so he doesn't have to talk about it when he gets there, he doesn't have to raise an offering, he doesn't have to do an auction, he doesn't have to bring it up, he doesn't have to use his energy that way. The point is, this was not the main thrust of the letter. This particular letter has 16 chapters. And is this chapter 16? He saved it till the end of the book. There's plenty of other issues that were going on in Corinth. He didn't make giving a major thrust, and he saved it to the end. Amen? We're learning about this in its proper context. But he is, however... While he saved it to the end, it was not the main thrust. He is making an extremely important point. The point that he is making to them about giving in this example, and in this particular case, giving offerings, free will offerings for the benefit of those who were in need. He is making an important point, that is, when you're giving. Unless it's sudden, unexpected, somebody really hungry, somebody in need right now, somebody in need along the way that you didn't expect to see, you should plan your giving in advance. It should be conscious, amen? You should plan your giving in advance and you should give liberally. You should give generously. You should give from a, in a generous mindset with a generous heart. It's not good enough, and it's not even a good thing at all, for a preacher to have to pull the offering out of you in real time. It's not a good thing for a preacher to have to spend all their energy, all their time, all their effort trying to get you to give. It shouldn't be their focus. Are you hearing me? He told them they should put it aside, plan it in advance. Because it shouldn't be something that he shows up there and has to spend time on or to talk about. Amen? I told you to hang in there with me though, right? Are you, are you learning anything so far? Are you learning something you already knew a little bit better? Maybe there might be a person or two that's offended, but I told you to hang in there with me, did I? So Paul did travel through Macedonia on his way to Corinth as he said that he would. And while he was in Macedonia, he wrote a second letter to the Corinthians. Amen? Amen. But this time, say this time, he spent two whole chapters just talking about this offering. You probably, I'm sure you've read it before, but you probably didn't take the context. Where was he going when he started this? And 
Yes, he's talking the whole time about this offering. Are you hearing me? The subject of taking up this offering for the poor Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. So go to 2 Corinthians for me. And when you get there, we're going to chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And when you get there, I promise you, if you go home and you read all of chapter 8 and all of chapter 9, Paul is only talking about this offering. Amen? Amen? So he's already written one letter saying, I'm on my way. And I'm in Ephesus, and I'm going to come to you by way. I'm going around the Aegean Sea, and I'm going to go over to Philippi. I'm going to go over to Thessalonica or Thessaloniki, if you want to say it more accurately. And I'm going to swoop on over, and I'm going to find you in the area, province called Achaia, uh, which they were in the specific city of Corinth. Are you with me? And so he's writing to this church a second letter. And I'm going to hurry up but also take my time because we're getting into the heart of what we need to learn. We already learned we should do it. We should set it aside, right? We should do it consciously. We should give liberally. It shouldn't have to be pulled out of us. The service should not have to be focused on you giving, amen, particularly when there's a need. So I'm going to read. He says, moreover, brethren, I'm sorry for the King James, but I'll, I'll fix it for you. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit, the king's language, <laughs> for the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. In other words, brethren, moreover, we want you to know, we want to tell you about the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia he says how that in great trial of affliction these folks are going through it they're being persecuted they're having it hard the abundance of their joy despite all of that they're joyous and their deep poverty so we always hear about the, Mas the Macedonians. We always hear about the, especially the Philippians being such great givers. But here he is about to give them such awesome credit and they were suffering both persecution and they had serious lack. The famine was hitting them hard. He says, and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality, meaning generosity. They were hitting, they were being hit hard, persecuted, and they were suffering lack. Verse three, for their power, meaning their ability, I bear record of their ability, yea, and beyond their power or ability, they were willing to, of themselves. What is he saying, saints? He's saying they gave as much as they were able. And they gave it of their own accord. So, Corinthian brothers and sisters, I'm coming your way. I'm headed your way. And I want to tell you that I said I would come to you via or on the way as I go through Macedonia. And now that I'm here, I'm letting you know these folks are being jacked up. They are having it hard. They are poor. They don't have much. And yet they gave as much as they could. Amen. And they gave it without me asking. Amen. Lord, have mercy. He's not done. He's not done. He says in verse four, praying us with much entreaty. Meaning, they gave of their own accord, they actually were begging us that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship, hallelujah, of the ministering of the saints. They begged us for the privilege of sharing in this ministry, this service. They were poor. They were suffering and they begged. 
I told you a couple weeks ago that a real godly giver, the thing that will kill them the most is not to be able to participate, to be shut out. Lord have mercy. Oh, he's preaching right here. Oh, he's teaching. Lord have mercy. Verse five. And this they did. Not as we hoped. Hallelujah. Not as we hoped. But first they gave of themselves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. He's saying they didn't give as we hoped. They exceeded our expectations. They exceeded our expectations. First giving themselves to God. That's the priority. Amen? If I meet somebody and they don't know the Lord, I'd much rather them give their lives to God than they give to the church. Verse 6. In so much that we desired Titus, hallelujah, that as he had begun so he would also finish in you the same grace also. I'm telling you about what the Thessalonians and the Philippians have done here in Macedonia, and I'm hoping that it inspires you. But he wrote this second letter, and he included two chapters because he had the sense that he needed to. He knew some things, and he figured he needed to, and he sent some folks ahead to make sure that they got it together. He wrote the second letter because there were problems. He included two chapters because there was a need. Amen? This is not somebody trying to shake you down. This is not somebody trying to take your money. This is somebody trying to help you do what you should really already want to do. But he's trying to help. Verse 7. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, this is so good, you abound in faith, hallelujah, and utterance, that is speech, oh, and you abound in knowledge, and in all diligence, meaning you quickly obey God, and whatever it is God's priority is, and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. Hallelujah. I know you're holified. I know you can quote every scripture. I know you can orate really well. I know that you say you'll do whatever God wants you to do quickly. How about this? Now we're talking about your money. How about this? Or are you mad at the preacher for telling you what God said? How about this? And then he wraps up in verse 8, or at least I'm wrapping up momentarily. He said, I speak not. This is good now for those of you who are getting a little bit of, I don't, probably nobody, we don't have a whole lot of offense when it comes to giving here. But he says, I speak not by commandment. So anybody who was getting huffed up, getting riled up silently, privately, secretly, you can exhale. I speak not. By commandment. We're talking about a free will offering. We're talking about an offering from the heart. Are you hearing me? I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove, to test the sincerity of your love. I'm not giving you a commandment. I'm trying to tell you what these folks who have nothing, almost nothing are doing, the spirit with which they give it, and the generosity with which they gave. I'm trying to inspire you with this example. I ain't got no commandment for you. I have no hammer upside your head. I'm not trying to coerce you. I'm trying to show you what's possible in terms of manifesting your love for God and his people. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. They gave liberally out of their lack. And so this wasn't, Paul wasn't asking them to give liberally out of lack because they had more. Amen? In Corinth. The, the Philippians or the Macedonians, they gave out of their lack 
And they chose to do that. And they have a reputation for giving that way. But Paul was just using this as an example to inspire them. And as we read here, we see that he explains the spiritual connection. But it wasn't by requirement. It wasn't by edict. What was it about? He made it plain. It was about sincere love, as this is an important part of ministry. Amen? Amen. Just as important as the other ones that we think of as being religious. And so the need was known a year before. Now, this man is now writing a second letter to these folks. And the, the need was known, identified, and a pro promises were made to give toward that need a full year ahead. And yet Paul, knowing what he knew, wrote a second letter and devoted two chapters because he knew what he was dealing with. Amen? So Paul goes on to say, same chapter. Now move on down. I'm skipping nine. Let's go ahead and go to ten. He says, and herein... I give my what? My what? My advice. I didn't come with no hammer upside your head. I'm trying to inspire you by showing you the faith and the action of others that have way less than you do. And herein I give my advice. For this is expedient for you. Who have begun before. You said you were going to do it before. We had every reason to believe that you were going to do it. But it's expedient for you not only to do. But also to be forward a year ago. Lord have mercy. Now therefore perform the doing of it. <laughs> is, he, is he being clear? So now... I know you got all kind of liberal and generous thoughts. I'm happy about your thoughts, but you need to follow through. Because if you thought it a year ago, you might have come up with a million excuses since then. You might have made new bills, so now you have an excuse not to give. And you should have been putting it away week by week, right? But I know you probably didn't. You might have been putting excuses week by week, rationalizations week by week, making new bills week by week. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it. And as there was a readiness to will, all right, you had the will, you had the desire, you had the mind, so there may be a what? Performance also out of what? Out of what? Out of what? That which you have. Oh, so you mean to tell me you're only being asked to give out of what you have? So that means you have something? That's pretty good. You mean he's not asking you to give out of what you don't have? He's not asking you to give your light bill money? You mean to tell me he's not asking you to give your grocery money? You mean to you tell me you live in a metropolis and you got to drive around? And you mean to tell he's not asking you to, to, to give of your, your bus pass money, your Metrolink money, your car note money, your house note money? He's not, really? Really? Lord have mercy. He says, out of that which you what? Have. Now, we already know where you got it. That's a whole nother message. We already know where you got it. He says, verse 12, for if there be first a willing mind, do you have a willing mind? Do we have willing minds? It is acceptable according to that that a man hath. Isn't that beautiful? And not, Lord have mercy, not according to that that he hath not. Ooh. For I mean not that other men will be eased and you be burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their lack, that, your, that their abundance may also be a supply for your lack, your want that there may be equality. Now, some of us have it so good, so much, some of us have it, have so much, some of us don't have to pay attention to when our paycheck is coming or not. Some of us don't even have to pay attention to how much the paycheck is. 
Some of us don't even watch our balance unless there's been some kind of uh, 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 identity theft. Then you start paying attention. You get all kinds of alerts. Amen. I, can't, I have that testimony. But some of us have it so good, we can't imagine being on the other side of the equation. So it seems like I give and I give and I give and I never get. I give and I'm always the giver and somebody is always the needer. And so some of us can't imagine what Paul is talking about here. But he is teaching us here and he has taught us here that just thinking about giving is not enough. Your intent must be followed through with action or it doesn't matter. Thinking generous thoughts is not good enough. Having generous intent is not good enough. Even the little widow with her little might, she gave her might. And God said that she gave more than the wealthy man who dumped a bunch of stuff in there. Lord have mercy. There is a level, hear me now, of offering for everyone. And it's not the same for everyone. The key so that there is no escaping, there is no justification, and if you're spending your time right now and your heart and your mind coming up with justifications, you have a bigger problem. You have a bigger problem. There's a couple chapters that need to be written to you and for you. The key thing is generosity from what you do have. Generosity with what you can do. And he's going to tell you in a minute, I want to make it very clear. It's not about what you don't have or what you can't do. What can you do? Do you do that? What can you give? Do you give that? Where is your heart? First, now, if you don't have the will, if you don't have the mind, you don't even have the intent to give. Now, that's a whole nother topic. But mostly to be left between you and your maker. You and your blesser. Because if you've gotten it figured out and you've decided that, oh, it's my hard work that gave me this money. It's my smarts that gave me this money. It's my education that gave me this money. It's my maneuvering that gave me this money. It's my connections that gave me this money. It's my promotion that gave me this money. You got the, you haven't read this. And you don't have the author of this inside of you. Certainly not quickened in your, in your spirit. Can't be. Not possible. You're making the same mistake that was made in the Garden of Eden all over again. Same mistake that was made many places throughout the Bible all over again. So the supposition here for us to benefit is that we have actual desire, right? Just like they did. And yet Paul knew what happens. We don't guard our minds. <laughs> we don't guard our hearts well enough. And so we have a thought. We have a rationalization. We have an excuse. And Satan helps you pile on. He don't want you giving to God's work. He doesn't want you giving to other people in need in God's name and for God's glory. Of course he doesn't. So he gives you all kinds of reasons. He'll tell you what well, I deserve, a blankety, blankety, blank. And I'm going to go get it even though I don't really have the money. Or technically I have the money and I also had enough money to give to God. But now I only have enough money to pay the piper. God knows everything. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So Paul goes on to say, we're in, uh, let's look over in chapter 9, I'm moving, moving along, in verse 6, he says, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap what? Also sparingly. And he that sows bountifully shall what? Reap also bountifully. Lord have mercy. So when it's your time, when it's your time of being in need, your blessings will be there if you give generously, amen? amen. And here's the thing, your need, Mr. Mrs. Moneybags, because you've been so blessed so much, guess what? Your need may not even be financial, but their need is financial. If you're going to preach a message to them while their bellies are empty, you're not meeting their need. If you have money and they have need, if you're wealthy and they're destitute, if you, you, they haven't been blessed in that area, but you have. Yeah. 
So when your time comes, that doesn't mean they're suddenly going to be wealthy and giving you money. But they might have something that you need. You just don't know what that need is yet. And you're testing the Holy Spirit. And that's not a good thing to do. Not a good thing to do. We learned. You're testing the Holy Spirit. You think we think too narrowly. You don't know what your need's going to be. And you don't know who can meet it. And that person will live to the next day because you helped them eat. And then they will be there with that thing that they know how to do. That thing that they have that you don't. We all have gifts. We all have talents. We all have things that we can offer. And guess what? You can be the most brilliant person, have all the degrees. There's something you don't know. There's something you don't have. There's something you don't know how to do. And that person, that ministry, may very well be your answer. But while we're sitting high and sitting pretty, while we're forgetting where we got what we got, while we're focusing on what we don't have instead of what we do have, while we're thinking thoughts of scarcity instead of much, we can rationalize ourselves away from our own blessing and our own privilege. Hallelujah. It may not be money that you need. Probably won't be money that you need. Verse 7. Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not what? Grudgingly or of what? Not because you have to give, not because somebody made you give. For God, what? Loveth a cheerful giver. Now you know the context of the verse, right? Now you know the real context of the statement. Now you probably heard this most of the time by those trying to coerce you to give more. You, you, you see the real context, right? Now you know what a real cheer, a cheerful giver, now the charlatans will have you believe that a cheerful giver means you give and you give as much as I tell you to give and you keep on giving as long as I'm putting on the auction and you keep on giving it. God will take care of your light bill. He'll pay your rent. Keep on giving because, because I just preached and I got to raise my own offering. You got to keep on giving. You, you, you've heard this in the, the wrong ways. You've heard it when it's out of greed. You've heard it when it's lying in my pocket. You've heard it because I mismanaged the church finances and I need you to solve it. Oh, it ain't a famine, something we don't control. This is where you've heard it. But you're hearing it in the right context now. He loves a cheerful giver because a cheerful giver is the one that has the intent to give. A cheerful giver is the one that can't wait to give. A cheerful giver is the one that even plans to give. A cheerful giver thoughtfully and prayerfully and generously plans to give a certain amount. And then gives it. Doesn't convince themselves not to on the way. Somebody's learning something. Or somebody's learning something they already knew even better. Lord have mercy. <sighs> yeah, you've probably heard this verse weaponized to say that you should want to give more just because they're telling you to and you're supposed to be glad about it. That's not what it's saying. That's not what it's saying. We see what the Bible says here. The more you give, the more you'll receive. But you shouldn't give to get. And yet it is indeed true that the greater heart you have and the greater faith you have toward giving, the greater that God can trust to bless you with in return. And please don't miss the point that your need might not turn out to be financial. I'm almost done. So lastly, let's just go to Romans chapter 15. 
We don't have much here. Uh, the parts that I would look at if we were to read it would be verses 25 through 27, where he just quickly says, but now he's writing to the Romans. He's actually in Corinth now. And he says, I go to Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. He does not mean preaching. He does not mean teaching. He means to serve them to make sure they can eat, to serve them to make sure that they know that they're loved and they're cared about from people far away that they don't even know. I want you to notice something. How many chapters does Romans have? That's 16. What chapter are we in right now? 15. Paul only says what I just said to you. And then he adds a little bit in there. For it's pleased them in Macedonia and Achaia, meaning Philippi, Thessalonica, and, 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 and Corinth, to make a certain contribution for the poor saints in Jerusalem. And then he goes on to say, you know what, you got religion from them, you got God from them, you got salvation through their God. So isn't it only fitting that you meet their need since you benefited through them? He didn't say a whole lot. That's all in this whole book that he wrote about giving to the Romans. <laughs> he doesn't mention the offering until almost the end. And then he barely touches on it. See, that's real. We can make whole ministries. We can have whole movements over something that's just really somebody trying to take their street game and dress it up in religious clothing, religious language, taking their street game or finding out that they can become somebody, they can become known, they can be wealthy, and they don't have to go to college for it. They don't have to get a job for it. They don't have to interview for it. They don't have to work outside of the church for it. They can run the game in the church. This letter has 16 chapters. He doesn't mention this until the 15th, and he barely mentions it even then. Now, he emphasized it heavily to Corinth. Why? Because they were on the, his planned path on his way back to Jerusalem to give the gift. Why? Because they were in the position to give, and there was a need. Why? Because he didn't want to focus on the giving once he got there. What preacher does want to? So I'm wrapping up now. It's time for review. What have we learned this morning about giving? We've learned that financial giving is an important part of our life and walk in ministry, we've learned uh, that it is a way that we show love to people, but also to God. We've learned that when possible, your giving should be planned, meaning you have the intent to do it and you sit it aside. Just as you were saving for college for your children, just as if you were saving for that house, just as if you were saving for that car, just as if you were saving for the quinceanera, just as if you were saving to be the hero when your daughter gets married, just, and just like that, it should be planned, which means, you know what, you, things that you plan, you know, I'm, I'm just going to be real, things that you plan are things you intend to really do. <laughs> the things you don't want to do, you put it off. And you have a built-in excuse when the time comes. The things that you plan, it could be good or bad. It could be first degree murder as opposed to manslaughter. Or second degree. Amen? You plan that thing out. Every detail. You knew a year from then you were going to scope out that school. <laughs> and do something wrong. It could be good or bad. The point is, if you plan it, that means you really meant it. The point is, if you plan it, you actually make sure the provision is there. You don't wait to try to make it a lump sum. You give as you're blessed. You give as you're blessed. Amen? 
We've learned that God loves and blesses a cheerful giver, but we also learned what a cheerful giver means. It is easier to give cheerfully when you give what you planned to give. Oh, I'm going to say that a couple more times. It's easier to give cheerfully when you plan to give in the first place, right? And it's easier to give cheerfully the amount that you planned to give. So when they start doing the auction and you don't feel right about it, that's on them, not you. You're not supposed to be happy because you're giving because they want to put something in their pocket. It's not, you're not supposed to be happy because they're trying to raise an offering so that they can be given what they should be given by the church that they came to bless. You're not supposed to feel good yeah, yeah. when they mismanage the funds, when they mismanage the church. Now they want you to pay for it. It doesn't mean you can't. It doesn't mean you shouldn't. It means that if you feel bad about it, you shouldn't have to feel bad about it. It means you better be given out of what you have and not what you don't have. It means that you're not being stingy if you don't follow their direction when they try to coerce you. I told you if you gave me some time, <laughs> you just have to see me see it through. Don't leave early. <laughs> we also learn you shouldn't be stingy. You should give liberally. <sighs> And you'll be blessed liberally. If you're thinking about what you have as opposed to what you don't have. See, if you think about what you don't have, you'll think stingy thoughts. And you'll end up giving less than you should or giving nothing at all. I'm done. Finally, we shouldn't have to give out of coercion. We shouldn't have to. And most of the time that coercion comes from greed, malfeasance. Um, or just trying to line an individual's pocket. I think it's pretty sad that we actually have a system in place. We literally have a system in place. So somebody comes and preaches to your people, you get to rest. And they get some, some new flavor. And then that same preacher has to raise their own honorarium. That's real talk. That's real talk. And then the people have to feel bad. Amen, and that's not, a, that's not a good thing. It's not meant to be. Hallelujah. So in this case, we're, le we're learning about people who are suffering from what mean people would call acts of God, basically a famine in the land. There's no rain, so they couldn't get food. Um, and so everything becomes too expensive, so the poor people suffer. That's what we're talking about, a real need. Not greed, not selfishness, and not malfeasance. And so we should not be stingy. We should be liberal givers. And so we thank the Lord. I thank God for just getting me through whatever I had to get through to get here today. So I can say yes, at least this one more time. We thank God for preserving these precious writings for our knowledge and our edification. And I thank you for your attention this morning. I pray that it helps you. I pray that it helps you appreciate and to uh, better understand this important part of ministry. This important part of serving God by serving people. Again, thank you for your attention. And to God, as always, be the glory. Amen. Amen.